So kind of, I think the application of these results, the fact that I didn't really find much of a subjective difference between the seats is you kind of get into a question of how much do you really need bolsters in the first place then? Because really when you kind of look into it biomechanically, there's not a lot of difference or there's not a lot of biomechanical reason for them. It is a subjective instrument. It's really there. So you so cost savings type of thing where, you know, if you can reduce down your bolsters to almost nothing and you don't really have any sort of subjective difference in it, then, you know, you save a few cents a seat, but, you know, over, you know, hundreds of thousands of seats, that turns out to be kind of a significant saving. I kind of the counterpoint to that would be, this is obviously very much a short term study. It really only lasted about 40 minutes per seat and that might, it doesn't really necessarily capture everything you want to see, particularly because, you know, this being a pandemic, collecting data during the pandemic, this was mostly done with people around my, people that I knew that I was fairly certain didn't have COVID-19. I think that a logical extension of this type of research would be to get into more of a field study, get into more of like a, you, the user base. So, you know, maybe professional users that are going to be in the field for, you know, 10 hours at a time, eight hours at a time. The difference is in that in the short term study, because another kind of important consideration about foam seeding is foam seeding deforms over time until it reaches max deformation, full compression. And something I probably didn't really capture with this study. So I think that's something that could be considered. And uh, considering that pressure mapping didn't really seem to have a lot of uh, bearing on the subjective evaluation, I think that maybe using different types of objective measurement might be a logical um, step forward. Whether that's something like an inertial measurement unit, looking at postures and seeing if seating has any sort of effect on postures, maybe something like electromyography, looking at muscle activation in different scenarios, or um, even getting into a little bit more of like your population segments, something like, you know, maybe looking at users that are particularly uh, uh, heavy set or, you know, female users. This study only had 15 participants. So kind of general, you know, big question population differences probably were a little bit beyond the scope of what we can talk about here. I think those are all fairly interesting or worthy other avenues of research that could be explored. And uh, is that, yeah, again, any questions? And if not, I think that's, yeah. If there are okay. any questions or comments for Clayton, any feedback? Okay. Well, Clayton, thank you so much. We really appreciate you coming on and sorry for the technical issue there a little bit ago. No problem. And, and stay warm there in North Carolina. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. University of South Florida. I hope everyone can hear me okay. If you do have a question, there should be a person at the top of the screen that you click and it raises your hand. That's where I can unmute you. Um, if you'd also like to comment, you can do so in the chat box or ask a question in the chat box.
Ayub, when you're ready to go, we can get started. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me? We can. All right. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Ayub Bodera, and I'm a graduate student at the University of South Florida. And I'm pursuing an MSPH uh, with a concentration in occupational exposure sciences, or um, what was formerly known as industrial hygiene. Uh, the work that I, I presented on the poster is in collaboration with uh, Dr. Bernard and Dr. Ashley, uh, both of the University of South Florida. And it's, 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 a, it's based on heat acclimatization, which is their area of, exper of expertise. Um, heat acclimatization is, is, is an array of physiological adaptations that allows our body to tolerate heat stress. And failure of this process may lead to heat injuries and illnesses such as um, uh, heat cramps, heat exhaustion, heat stroke, and even death. Uh, recent findings by OSHA and CDC have indicated that uh, workplace uh, heat acclimatization programs are either inadequate or, um, or, or absent. And um, this has raised a question into whether there should be more look into these acclimatization programs. Um, heat acclimatization can be accomplished through a variety of methods and different researchers have put a, a lot of methods for acclimatizing workers. Unfortunately, unfortunately, there is no consensus on which method really, uh, one method that can be applied to all situations. The, this study purpose, the study for this, the, the purpose for these studies uh, was to just examine this, the acclimatization studies prior to and at finishing a one uh, week acclimatization program using two different protocols. Um, there were 43 participants uh, who were put through the two programs and they, they, they were, the, the, the research took place in a climatic chamber, which involved walking on a, on a treadmill for two hours at a moderate work rate, uh, which is about 300 watts. 35 of these participants were put in condition one, which we called hot and dry. It had a temperature of 50 degrees and uh, 20% relative humidity, which is equivalent to 36 degrees WBGT. And eight were put in the second conditions, which were, uh, which were 40 degrees Celsius and 30% relative humidity. Uh, this is equivalent to 30 degrees WBGT. Uh, the reference TLV is 28 degrees. So acclimatization studies was accessed at the beginning and during and at the end of these trials using uh, rectal temperatures and heart rates. So at the beginning of the program, only 14% of the participants uh, were assessed to be tolerating heat at the level, at that level for the hot and dry conditions but only um, about 75% under the warm and humid conditions. 34% uh, of these participants were assessed as being unacclimatized under the hot and dry conditions compared to only 25% of the warm and humid conditions. So that was the first day. Come on the last day when the program was ending, 34% uh, of the participants were assessed as fully acclimatized under the hot and dry conditions, while there was no change under the warm and humid conditions. Um, another 34% were assessed to be partially acclimatized. That means they were showing some progress of being acclimatized. And 31% showed no improvement completely under the hot and dry conditions compared to 25% of those participants under the warm and humid uh, 
uh, protocol. These results were expected since both protocols were above the recommended TLV. Remember that the recommended TLV is 28 degrees Celsius. And more so, more people were able to tolerate heat better under the less severe protocol. So remember the, the warm and humid conditions were only two degrees above the TLV. Uh, the warm and humid was only 30 degrees about uh, 30, 36, 30 degrees WBGT and compared to the harsh condition or the more severe condition, the hot and dry conditions. So in short, what I concluded from this um, uh, research is that the higher the heat stress level, the harder it is to tolerate heat and that heat acclimatization is achieved by subjecting participants or individuals to heat stress level above the TLV. So when the program starts, some individuals will already be acclimatized, while others will not. Um, so there is need to rethink and perhaps investigate further the implementation of heat acclimatization program. There are very many questions that might be asked of why uh, most workplaces do not have heat acclimatization program, or is it just because it, it's just hard to, 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 to go through the process? So the questions that maybe remains to be asked, uh, do we need to take every individual through the entire acclimatization program? or should we actually assess the acclimatization studies before we, 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 we even put them through the program? And if all this is done, then it can help in onboarding workers to, the, to their workplaces earlier. And uh, so that th th there remains to be a lot of questions to be answered, but that's what I found out from uh, looking into these two protocols. So again, thank you very much for taking time to listen to my poster presentation. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll, I'll, I'll take them. If anyone has any questions or comments, you can hit the raise your hand bar and then I can unmute you or you can type them in the chat. Again, it says, do you think that acclimatization protocols should be universally applied or only in particular regions? Oh, that's that's a very good question, Clayton. Thank you for asking. Um, there, it, it's, it's impossible to have a universal uh, heat acclimatization program just because of what you mentioned, that different regions have different uh, climatic conditions. So that's why it's, it's, it's hard for, for, for there to be fixed um, uh, conditions. What we need to do is probably just have maybe, it depends on what region you are. So we cannot say, because I don't know what the relative humidity, humidity will be at say North Carolina compared to here during the heat season. So it will all depends on the region. We, there's no way there can be a uniform uh, uh, um, uh, protocol. What what uh, what Dr. Bernard and Dr. Ashley are working on is because um, based on based on the research, they they're trying to find out if if we can get away from the conditions, but rather put 
put um, uh, lower limits versus upper limits for acclimatizations, which will not be based on um, uh, the type of protocols that are there. But that's that's another research uh, different from what I was doing. So they're trying to come up with a different way that can be universal or propose a different way of um, uh, acclimatizing workers that can be applicable universally without without uh, particular depending on particular regions uh, weather conditions. So I hope I answered your question. But really, there can never be a universal acclimatization protocol. Anyone else have any questions or comments? Thank you so much, Ayub. We really appreciate your time. We are on the schedule. Um, if Stephanie Cleland would want to present now, we can go on ahead and start that. I'm happy to present now. Okay. Ayub, thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Okay, Stephanie, can you hear me? Yes, I'm muted. Okay, you should be ready to go. I'm gonna wait for my poster to finish loading quickly. Okay. And this is Stephanie Cleland. She is from the University of North Carolina. Um, so, hi, I'm Stephanie Cleland. I'm a PhD student at UNC Chapel Hill in environmental science and engineering in the School of Public Health. And the work I'm presenting today has to do with estimating smoke concentrations during wildfire events. And the motivating goal for this work is smoke concentrations, which are really complex mixtures. So we specifically focus on PM 2.5 within smoke, um, are difficult to estimate accurately, given how the smoke plumes change rapidly over short distances and over short periods of time. So this work aimed to use um, three different data sets, specifically surface observations, satellite derived estimates, and chemical transport model output, and look into the best way to combine those three data sets to most accurately estimate uh, concentrations during the 2017 California wildfires, which when this research was funded were some of the worst fires to date, but since 2017, there's been a lot more devastating wildfires. Um, you know, emphasizing the importance of this work. And another important thing to note with this work is it's important because many people can shelter indoors during fire events, but for the populations that are unable to, such as outdoor workers or agricultural workers, understanding what these concentrations look like are really important for understanding the potential exposure and health impacts. Um, so as I mentioned, we use something called the Bayesian Maximum Entropy Framework and the Constant Air Quality Model Performance Method to bias correct and combine three data sets. And this included surface observations from both uh, permanent and temporary monitoring stations. It included output from a CMAP model. And it also included um, satellite-derived estimates from the MODIS Terra satellite. And what we found when we kind of looked at different methods for combining these is that in order to get the best estimate of uh, PM2.5 concentrations during the fires, uh, combining all three provided that best estimate. Um, so combining the satellite observations and model output. And not only does, was this most accurate at estimating concentrations, it also provided the best refinement of the smoke plume shape uh, and location. So it really gave that nuanced detail at a one kilometer resolution of where those pockets of high concentrations were located, which again is really important during wildfire events. Um, so the main, I mean, the main takeaway from this work was that when available, it's best to combine all available data sets when trying to estimate PM 2.5 concentrations during a fire event. And 
Um, we also recommend applying a bias correction to model output, which is uh, one of the other things we did in order to prove, uh, improve the accuracy of the uh, model's uh, estimation accuracy. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions. And I'm not sure if, why my poster disappeared, but. Okay, can you hear me, Stephanie? Okay, perfect. Does anyone have any questions for Stephanie or comments? If you have any questions, you can either raise your hand in the icon at the top of your screen or you can comment in the chat. It says, is your work applicable for PM10 as well or will require a different model? Yeah, that's a great question. So the benefit of the method we used here is that as long as you have data available for your pollutant of interest, be it PM10, be it ozone, if you're able to have model output for that pollutant, if you're able to have surface observations for that pollutant, you're able to use this method to do a data fusion of those data sets. So this would be applicable for PM10, uh, depending on what data you have available. Anyone else have any comments or questions for Stephanie? Okay, Stephanie, thank you so much. We really appreciate your time. Next up, we do have Laura Taylor. Laura, if you would like to, we're, we are a little bit early. If you'd like to present now, we can do that. Let me just pull your poster. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, and I'll put you up at the top of the screen. And you're all set. Thank you. Okay. So my research was on occupational exposure to isocyanates. These are a chemical that are found in a lot of products, uh, including polyurethane paint and um, things that are commonly used by the general population as well, like crazy glue and gorilla glue. Uh, and the biggest concern with them is that isocyanates are one of the leading causes of occupational asthma around the world. And um, I don't know what happened to my poster. Should I, do I need to do something to pull it back up? Okay, so um, in my particular study, we looked at 24 workers who do um, spray painting of cars. So they're working with aerosolized polyurethane paint. And because it's aerosolized, it really envelops
Laura, your um, volume has went out and I'm trying to get that fixed. Just one second. Okay, Laura, see if um, it works. The, the volume is still not working. Um, do you, did you by chance hit a mute button? No, okay. I'm getting in touch with DCE right now. My apologies. Okay, Laura, we have we have you still as live, but the volume is not working. I have DCE on the phone. They're trying to fix the problem. I'm so sorry. This is Ashley Rockwell. I am the moderator. Laura's volume has went out and I have DCE working on this now. She is typing in the chat. My apologies for the technical issues we're having.
On my end, it shows that Laura is not muted. It shows that she is live. Laura, I'm sorry for this inconvenience. Laura Taylor is the one that is presenting. Can you please unmute her? Laura has written, this study was done before adverse health development, though, which implies that inflammation is able to impact. On her end, the mic is unmuted and we still cannot hear her. There we go, Laura. Laura, are you able to use the mic now? I hear background noise, but we still cannot hear Laura.
Hello, can anybody hear me? Yes. You can hear me? Yes. Oh, yes. Great. Okay, wonderful. Is this Laura? Yes, it is. Perfect. Okay. Okay, okay it's working. I am so sorry. Technical difficulties. I am I am so sorry. Yeah, well, I'm sorry for the audience. Thanks for uh, sticking around through that. Sticking around everyone. Um, Laura, I'm going to hand it off to you so we don't lose um, any more time. I'm so sorry. Thank you. Okay, well, we're actually still ahead of schedule from <laughs> when I was supposed to start. Exactly. So um, I guess we're, we're still on time, surprisingly, which is good. Um, all right, so uh, back to my study. We had... Um, these workers who work in small auto body shops spray painting cars and um the a subset of these workers will likely go on to develop isocyanate induced asthma and once they have it there's no cure for it they have it for the rest of their life and they usually have to change either what job they're doing in the shop or change careers completely so it's very disruptive to their lives and we're trying to figure out more about uh, inter-individual variability and who develops isocyanate-induced asthma and who doesn't, and what we can do uh, beforehand to help prevent that, because the mechanism of sensitization still isn't really known. Um, if we can learn more about what protein pathways are involved in um, in the metabolism and distribution and excretion of isocyanates and the um, generation of adverse health effects, then we should be able to um, better pinpoint interventions. So um, with this um, particular study, there were 24 workers. We had measures of their inhalation exposure and skin exposure and also measurements of um, the biomarker levels in their plasma and urine. So the biomarkers we were using were specific to the parent compounds is just um, with NH2 group at the end instead of N uh, NCO, which is the isocyanate group. And um, we found that there were 38 CPG markers that were associated with differences in those biomarker levels between workers when we were controlling for their exposure levels through skin and inhalation. And um, mixed modeling showed that the um, skin exposure was really important in addition to inhalation. So a lot more really should be done to help protect workers from absorbing it in their skin so they don't have as much body burden in the first place. Uh, but another thing that was interesting is uh, looking at those that are associated with these epigenetic markers. There are um, uh, functions that in involve inflammatory pathways. Uh, some other things include cell-cell adhesions, calcium transport, neurotransmitter release, um, keratinocyte migration, and apoptosis regulation. Um, and most of which can also impact levels of inflammation in someone's body. And um, this study was done before there were any adverse health effects from isocyanates. And normally we think of inflammation as being associated with disease outcomes once somebody already has that adverse health effect. So it's really interesting to find this uh, in healthy workers. And I think what's happening is this kind of cycle where um, if there is exposure to isocyanates and somebody has more inflammation in their body, it means their cell adhesions are gonna be weaker, especially in the blood vessels, because one of the main things inflammation does is make it easier for white blood cells to respond to the site of inflammation in tissue. So it has to be able to migrate through those blood vessels and presumably isocyanates can migrate through more easily as well. And um, so if you have greater uptake into the body, you have more time isocyanates can be re reacting with cells. 
Isocyanates are toxic to skin cells and can cause cell death. So then you can have more inflammation because of that. And um, the more inflammation you have, the more distribution to tissues is, is potentially happening. And um, so you can get that spike that I keep on the poster. And uh, at the very bottom, you can see this progression over time where it looks like there is um, this inhalation and skin exposure to isocyanates that are taken up into the body. And then uh, there are genetic and epigenetic markers that can change the toxicokinetics and toxicodynamics of isocyanates, which early on we see as differences in biomarker levels. And over time, um, we see differences in asthma susceptibility between workers. Okay, am I back? I think I was lost for a little bit. <laughs> Hopefully people can hear me. Okay, so um, one of the encouraging things about these findings is it means we can potentially help um, intervene before workers get sick. And uh, we want to study whether reducing levels of inflammation in their bodies can help prevent at least some cases of occupational asthma from developing. Uh, does anybody have questions? Do you know how many workers in the USA are exposed to okay, I don't know. Yes, I'm sorry. I need to put my glasses on. I am sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. It's um uh good question. I'm trying to remember the most recent figures. I think it's like a few hundred thousand. Um and, and globally, isocyanates are one of the leading causes of occupational asthma. Uh, so getting this under control would um, result in billions of dollars of, of savings, um, both to employers and employees and healthcare providers. Hey, Laura, I got a question for you. Sure. Um, how did you control for other possible asthma-inducing compounds uh, among the painters? Because I know there's there's that possibility. Great question. Yes, thank you. Um, one of the things we looked at was smoking, and we know which of our workers used to smoke, who currently smokes, and who never has smoked in their life. And when we added that to the mixed modeling. We found it, it wasn't changing the results at all. So it doesn't seem to be impactful either for the epigenetics in this study or um, the genetic aspect, which I uh, presented on last year, looking at how um, isocyanate uh, genetic differences impacts variability of biomarker levels. Oh, thank you. In the uh, small body shops, about what percentage of their job is actually comprised of spray painting? I've worked in some uh, truck manufacturing plants, like you know, big rig trucks, and though there were certain people that that was their entire job, you know, eight hours a day when they were spray painting. Was that the case there? Uh, wow! Thank goodness that was not the case for our guys. <laughs> that is quite a lot. That that feels a big risk for the workers. I hope they're given really good protection. But uh, our guys were in general doing about two to four painting tasks per day. And they have maybe uh, like 
five to 30 minutes kind of a range. Okay. Oh, wow. So. And yeah, even with less. that, we're, we're able to find these, <laughs> these important differences. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Mm, thank you. Another uh, thing people tend to be interested in is how big a risk is it to individuals and the general public? And uh, luckily it's not too much risk to the general public. It's more so an occupational concern when uh, you're exposed to wet um, polyurethane paint or, or isocyanate products that haven't cured yet. Uh, some of these guys are, are working with it for a couple of years before they actually develop the asthma. So you you said you that that, that uh, the total contribution was from skin and um, through inhalation. Is there one that was particularly more than the other, or how you couldn't tell? I uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. With inhalation exposure, that's something we need to estimate because uh, they have different levels of respiratory protection. So we used uh, a standard way to try to correct for that. And uh, we have their breathing zone measurements. And then let's say if they have a half-faced respirator on uh, with disposable filters, we'd reduce uh, the estimated inhalation by a factor of 10. Um, for a supplied air respirator, respirator, it'd be decreased by a factor of 1,000. Um, but most of these, guys had a uh, half face respirator on and um, many of them had gloves. Some of them had exposed skin though. So we did uh, skin tape strip measurements to um, estimate their skin exposures. And when looking at the mixed model results, uh, skin was coming up a bit more often uh, than inhalation, but ab about just as much um, depending on we were looking at two chemicals, um, one six hexamethylene diisocyanate monomer and also one of its trimers, uh, HDI isocyanurate, and uh, in the two different media, so plasma or urine. And um, <clears throat> there's variation in whether inhalation or skin exposure was more important within those various categories, uh, but we're currently, they both came up. Uh, um, skin exposure is something that hasn't really received enough attention uh, in the United States. In Europe, they give their workers better skin protection than they do here. So the two pictures on the top right hand side that you see, the one on the left is a European worker and the one on the right is one of our guys uh, from the United States. And these were shops in Washington State in, in North Carolina. Um, so we have a lot of improvement we can do with reducing skin exposure in the United States. Okay, another comment with nice presentation. Was there any controlling for race? We did look at age and ethnicity as well. Uh, most of the workers, they were all men, uh, so we didn't have any complications with gender uh, or, or sex, I suppose. Um, but with ethnicity, we grouped based off of um, white or um, non-white, any further stratification we didn't really have enough data or, or diversity in our group to be able to do that. And it, it wasn't showing uh, associations. Uh, neither was age uh, in almost any case except there's one situation where, we, where age was important. And uh, with the genetic study I had done, we found the same thing where uh, we looked at um, ethnicity there and, and didn't find any associations for, for it either.
does anyone else have any um, questions or comments for Laura? Okay. Laura, thank you so much. We really thank appreciate you. your time. I am so sorry for the craziness of technology and what happened earlier. <laughs> so sorry, guys. I really am. Um, I wanted to let you guys know, um, so we end at 320, and then there will be a, a break where they'll have the center updates. And from there, um, there's a virtual cocktail hour. Uh, there's three breakout rooms. If you want to join any of them, you can. I believe you can go in and out of them. Um, one social hour. There's another one called Talking Shop or Not. And then there's Professional Organization. So you'll find a couple different organization uh, representatives in there. Um, AIHA, I believe, is one of them. We really, really appreciate the four of you all presenting today. You did a fantastic job. Again, I am I'm sorry about a little bit of the technical issues that we've had, um, but this was fantastic. And just want to thank you guys again tomorrow. Um, the keynote is Steve Tucker. He's with Jim Beam Suntory. It'll be a great talk. Um, we also have um, another panel, a research panel, and then we have more um, pilot presenters. So we look forward to seeing you all tomorrow as well. Um, if you just want to hang around, they'll put you back into the general session. And then if you choose to go to um, virtual cocktail hour, you can pick one of those rooms. Um, if not, we hope to see you tomorrow. So thank you all so much. Um, stay warm and safe. I know here in Kentucky, we're going to get round three of our ice storm. And we're very thankful we still have power. So um, again, just want to thank everyone.